what's up everybody so um i have a couple announcements to make the first is that i am going to be away from youtube for about two months i promise i will upload again on or before march 1st i'm going to be working with devon to you know get his rap started and hopefully i will have uh some new songs for you here soon um, the link to Devin's YouTube will be down in the description. I don't think we'll have anything up just yet, but as soon as we do, I will let you guys know on uh, Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. So if you guys don't follow me on there yet, I will put the links to those down below as well in the description. Um, for this recording, I am going to be doing I going to be reading some of my book. Uh, just a couple of chapters. Um, I know I've been talking about it for some time, not just on social media, but on YouTube as well. And I am still in the process of trying to get it out there and get it published. So if you take a liking to the book while I'm reading it, then you're more than welcome to donate. Um, I... <laughs> I've been working on this book for the better part of 20 years, give or take a few. Um, I've taken a lot of inspiration from authors from my childhood, such as C.S. Lewis, you know, Chronicles of Narnia, and uh, J.R. Tolkien, Lord of the Rings, and of course, Harry Potter, J.K. Rowling herself. Um, uh, so yeah, if you take a liking to this book after I, you get done listening to this, then by all means you're welcome to donate. A link to the donation website will be in the description as well. Um, I am working right now on thinking up some really good rewards for uh, don probably donation amounts of $50 plus, maybe even $100 if you guys feel like doing that. And let me know in the description what you think you would like. I know I bounced around the idea of um, providing signed copies for um, donations of the book. But, you know, you just let me know what you think in the description. Or in the, in the description. Just let me know what you think in the uh, comments below. I'm always welcome and happy to answer any questions you've got, so if you have any, you can go ahead and ask me. Uh, other than that, I look forward to seeing you all again in March. So, I hope you enjoy this next bit. Bye. Prologue. The Prophecy. The year is 4320, and the world as you may know it is now changed. The continental plates have come together once again to create a second Pangaea-like continent known as Parthus. Parthus is made of several different countries, each with their own territories, rulers, governmental systems, and languages. But that is not the only changes that have taken place. Sometime around the 30th century, there was a worldwide blackout in technology. No one really knows what happened but some had thought it was created by the, a devastating virus. The world never recovered their technological advances, and instead people turned back to medieval technology. Years passed, and life as it was had been all but forgotten. A new age began, and over time, as the continents grew closer, World War III erupted. Lands and territories were reformed, bloodlines and races mixed beyond recognition, and a long-kept secret was revealed. A timeless race of humanoid beings emerged one day to the surprise of all, an ancient race of strong, skilled warriors, healers, and craftsmen. Along with their skills and gifts, they brought a new kind of technology, one that far exceeded any known to man before. The technologies that these people brought with them were mind-boggling. Instead of rows upon rows of code and electricity, wires and software, they combined magic and machine to create complex devices and mechanisms that did the impossible, such as gateways that defied physical space. This race referred to themselves as Shigotians and offered to help the humans, but try as they might, the humans were just not ready for their help. 
At first, they were scared but welcomed the help. After only a few years, rumors began to spread that Chagotians were trying to wipe humanity from the face of the earth. They began to shun and hunt down Chagotian people in ignorant fear and all in the name of God, saying that these beings were a blatant affront to God and the like. Over time, because they refused to fight back, the Shigotians disappeared and were believed to have been wiped out. Their technology and their ways faded into myth and legend, and they were never heard from again. Time passed, and people changed. But that was not enough to stop the inevitable. A new and unperceived threat now lay before them, and there was only one person who was aware of this fact and knew how to stop it. A woman, a prophetess of God and leader of the Mahadavali Temple of the Lord God, Mahadavali Temple for short. She was a revered woman and was said to have a direct line to God, something that no one else had achieved in many, many years. It now fell upon her to inform and prepare the people of Parthas, starting with the leaders of her own country of Maradia, about this new threat. Earlier that week, she had spent an entire day writing and sending letters to all the leaders and well-off families of Maradia, asking them to meet her at the temple she ran for an important message from the Lord. Now the prophetess stood staring out at all the people gathered into the tiny room. She had been dreading this moment for some time, but the time had come. The vision she had received not more than two days ago had left her waking up, waking up shaken and covered in a cold sweat. It was a horrendous vision of the end, blood, smoke, and fire, the things that nightmares were made of. Still, there was a small glimmer of hope and that glimmer being why these men and women were now gathered in the meeting chamber of the temple. I grow impatient. A short, fat, balding man dressed in extravagant robes and standing at the center of the room raised his voice, letting all know his irritation. Why have you called us all here? I have better things to do than sit around twiddling my thumbs. The man, named Bartimaeus Karsten, was the Earl of Bisbet one of the seven territories of the country of Maradia. The prophetess turned her hooded face to the man. Yes, I suppose I owe an explanation. She paused, thinking of how best to word her next statement. I have grave news. I'm not quite certain how to say it, but enough. Just come out and say it already. The man spat at her. We've been standing and waiting for you long enough. She sighed. Very well. The end of the world is coming. Soon. To this there was an audible, sharp intake of breath, followed by murmurs and mutterings from the crowd. Many looked frightened and some were skeptical, but all were worried by her statement, save for one man. He stood in the corner of the room, almost obscured by the crowd of people all around him. But she had noticed him the moment he walked in. He was of average height, with long, blonde hair that curled at the base of his neck, and bright blue eyes. His face was strong, and his chin was shadowed by the ghost of a beard. He was a ranger of sorts, an assassin, a wanderer. They called them wild walkers. Men like him would usually not be seen unless they wanted to be, but her eyes were sharp, not missing anything in the room. He stared at her calmly, almost nudging her with his eyes to continue. It was hard for her to remove her attention from him, but she had a job to do. Silence, please. There is no need for fear or panic. The time for this is still a fair amount into the future. We have ample time to prepare. She smiled calmly, and almost instantly the room became quiet. There is yet hope, so I beg of you not to let yourselves despair. Yes, the end is near, but hope, like a phoenix, rises from the ashes of a long-forgotten people. A bloodline, long since thought erased from the annals of time. 
a child bearing the gift of choice. In the time that she comes of age, the world will begin to wither, and out of the dark and decay shall come some seven, whose purpose will be to bring ruin and rot into the world. Seven, who would take the woman she will become, and use her for their own ventures. If she gives in to the hate of this world, then we will all perish. But if she finds it in her heart to love, then the world will be spared. A younger man in fanciful robes spoke up. How, how do you know all this? Another grandfatherly looking gentleman answered him. Do you not know where you are and whom it is you question? I fear I do not, the young man said quizzingly. Bartimaeus huffed his disapproval at the man. <laughs> it is an inferior man such as yourself that give me headaches. This place is the Mahatavali temple of the Lord God, and that is the prophetess who leads the temple. She is known to have a direct line to God himself. He speaks with her, at least. <laughs> That's what she would have you believe. I, however, as many times as I have come to her for counsel from God, believe her to be a flaming fake, as evidenced by this latest prediction. If you would follow the counsel I give you, then you would believe, the prophetess retorted icily. I beg your pardon, Bartimaeus huffed. I followed your silly little suggestions and lost half of my territory. If only you had followed my counsel to its extent, the prophetess scoffed. But this time, you must follow my counsel to the letter if we are to succeed. Bartimaeus abruptly stomped his foot and shouted at the prophetess, You cannot be serious! We are leave to leave our fate in the hands of a feeble woman? She scowled at him from beneath her hood, and quicker than he could see, she stood before him with a dagger to his throat. Take care that you do not speak foolishly, lest your tongue make your end, sir. She snarled. I called you here to try and save you, and you dare insult my aptitude and my words? You go too far. Am I not a woman? And am I not more than capable of ending you here and now? Uh, of course you are, m-m-m-lady. Forgive my r rudeness and imp impudence. He stuttered and fell back onto the floor as pale as snow. She lowered the blade, staring coldly down at him in utter disgust. He could only look at the blade that the prophetess held at her side and whisper further apologies and praises at her. Satisfied, she turned and headed back to her place at the front, the crowd parting to make way for her as she went. Now standing at her place on the makeshift podium in front of the stunned crowd, she slowly turned to face them. I know that this is a shock to you all, but I implore you to follow the directions I sent to your homes. I called for all of you specifically because you have the power and influence needed to prompt the rest of the world to accompany us, to make ourselves ready for battle. If we come together as human beings, we can defeat those whom we tend to intend to destroy us. Will you comply and work together? Heads bobbed up and down around the room, accompanied by murmurs of agreement. She sighed deeply as relief washed over her. Thank you. We need to move swiftly to ensure that our word gets around in time. We must not delay. Now return to your homes and begin preparations. Instructions will be sent to your home shortly after you arrive. I will do my part here. Well met, and may long life and prosperity be yours. The room emptied swiftly, and all those in attendance left to hurry home, and silence descended on the room. The wild walker, who had been standing motionless in the corner, now pushed himself lazily off the wall, and began making his way towards her. He stopped, 
mere feet from her and put his hand across his heart and bowed his head respectfully. She giggled and gestured for him to lift his head. Forgive my intrusion. I have been... As he began to speak, she cut him off by raising her hand. She smiled gently at him, removing her hood. Upon her unexpected move, he quickly averted his eyes. It was a well-known law that to see the face of a prophet or prophetess was a death sentence for the perpetrator if they were caught. Even worse, if the prophet or prophetess was found out to have solicited it, then they too would be killed. Why do you look away? She frowned. Do you not care to look upon my face, husband? He turned just his eyes to her and responded, It is not proper to gaze upon the blessed face of a prophetess. He then lowered his voice as he continued, I fear that someone may find out about us, and your reputation may be ruined. There is not a soul here, she frowned. Would it ease your worries if we returned home? She met his gaze with a hint of disappointment in her eyes. She longed to have a normal relationship with him, like other married couples. He nodded and took the lead towards the door behind her. She replaced her hood and followed. They entered the room and proceeded to the deepest chamber past two stone griffins and through the last door. In that room sat an orb of white light with hundreds of smaller orbs dancing silently around it. Together they drew close and stepped through. The surroundings changed and they now stood in the bedroom of a small house built for two. He turned to look at her and frowned deeply. She removed her ceremonial robes and put them in their familiar hiding place before she turned to him. Does something bother you? She asked gently, cupping his worried face in her hands. He was rugged and handsome, and his deep, penetrating eyes bore into her soul. His blonde hair, though disheveled, was always draped so perfectly around his shoulders. She especially loved the way the shorter strands fell down and framed his eyes. He wrapped his arms around her and drew her into him. Was that really the best of ideas? He sighed. There was no one there to see us, I assure you, she smiled up at him. While I am worried about that, it's not what I was referring to, he said, pulling away just enough to place his hand on her slightly rounded belly. You shouldn't overdo it. I could have easily silenced that man. Remember, please, that you carry our unborn child. Should anything happen to either of you, I would suffer and die of a broken heart. He touched the porcelain-like skin of her face with one rough, battle-scarred hand and drew it from her temple down to her chin and then down her throat before slipping his fingers into her silken hair. He felt her body shiver in excitement and a pleased smile curled his lips, and he leaned in and kissed her deeply. She smiled contentedly and sighed, feigning discontent. You needn't be such a worry wart. We are both just fine. She wrapped her arms around him and placed her head in his chest. I know that it was a bit much for me to draw my blade, but it was necessary to shut him up. If you say so. All that matters to me is that you two are safe. He sighed and kissed the top of her head gently. He then led her over to the bed and they fell in it together and there is where they remained for the rest of the night, talking and laughing until they fell asleep. A hundred or years so, a hundred or so years passed, and the child who was to be the Xi'an, also known as the Key, was born. Chapter One: Her Brother's Fight. It was a bright, sunny May morning the kind of morning that was meant for exploring and discovery. The wind blew gently through the open window, warm and full of the smell of fresh flowers, grass, and damp earth. A young woman no older than 21 sat on her bed reading a novel. It was an adventure novel. 
She had hungrily devoured it since she got it yesterday, and was almost finished. She would have finished it sooner if the candle hadn't burned out so soon. She had reluctantly set the book aside till morning, and as soon as there was enough light from the morning sun, she awoke and resumed her reading. She now sat hunched over it, her eyes barely keeping up with the words as she flew over the page, eagerly trying to find out what happened to the characters, and before she knew it, the last page had been read, and she put the book down with a contented sigh. She sat and stared out her window, absent-mindedly, in her head, she reviewed the events in the book, and in her heart, she yearned to have such exciting exploits. A sweet breeze blew through the window, carrying with it the airy scent of cherry blossoms. The breeze swept over her face and gently ruffled her strawberry blonde hair. Her gray eyes glazed over as she imagined herself alongside the characters in her book. She was just short of average height and could be described as being muscular, but certainly not fat. The sun shone gently through the window on her fair skin and warmed her. In appearance, she looked to be an ordinary young lady with an odd obsession for adventure novels. She was beautiful in her own right, strong and sure-hearted. But her beauty never even crossed her mind. She was more focused on excitement as she was an explorer at heart and longed to be on an adventure, like the ones in her storybooks. She dreamed of far-off places and distant wonders so much that the things that preoccupied most girls' thoughts, such as boys and fashion, never graced her own. Right now, especially, her mind was preoccupied by thoughts of far-off lands and discovery. She sighed again. This time, her sighs were burdened and heavy. If only she could go on an adventure. Alas, being a woman, and a young woman at that, she was repeatedly scoffed at or ignored by everyone, and told that women were feeble and would be of no use on such excursions. Everyone, that is, except her mother. In fact, her mother used to tell her that if she really wanted to, she could even fly to the moon and carve her name in it for all to see. A smile graced her lips as she remembered how her mother would end every bedtime story with that statement. Her mom was wonderful and a beautiful woman. So beautiful, in fact, that travelers who were walking or riding down the road would often stop and stare at her with their mouths wide open. It was a well-known fact that their house harbored a jaw-droppingly beautiful woman, and in order to keep traffic from jamming up around their house, their father, a handsome man in his own right, would have to force them to keep moving, often resulting in awkward and hilarious conversations. It had always been a source of entertainment for the young woman when she was a child, but she had long since grown bored with it. Nowadays, there was little left that excited her, aside from her books and daydreams. Not that long ago, she would quickly rush through her chores, just so she could spend the rest of her day exploring the territory of her hometown, and the woods as far as her father allowed her. A few years of entertainment was all they afforded her before she inevitably, inevitably explored every nook and cranny of every teeny tiny minuscule inch of them. Her town, her home, and her life outside of her books now bored her nearly to death. Every day had become tedious and predictable to her. One, once more, a sigh escaped her. It carried with it the weight of her frustration. What was a young woman to do, she pondered. No one would accept taking a woman on a journey with them, and she highly doubted they would accept her going on one by herself. Though. If she knew she could get away with it, she would have her knapsack packed and be long out the door before you could say, get going. Just as she was getting up to put the book in her knapsack she could, so she could take it back to the library, she heard her name being called by a gentle and soothing voice. Myla, her mother called. Yes, mother, I'm coming, she called back enthusiastically. 
Mila was her name, and she had always loved the way it sounded. Her mother had said that it meant blessed. Her full name was Mila Ileana Shrinen. Her father was supposedly the son of a shrine prophetess, or something like that. And that was why their last name was Shrinen. It was hard for her to remember all the details that, what with her head so filled with imaginings of far-off lands and exotic creatures, jovial people, and harrowing affairs. She shook her head and returned her focus to the task at hand. Now was not the time to be daydreaming. Her mother was awake and needed her help with breakfast. Mila flew down the stairs to greet her as she stood in the kitchen peeling potatoes. Morning, Mom! She gave her a quick peck on the cheek before taking up an apron and a paring knife. She, her two brothers, Amethal and Zarel, and her father, Kino, and her mother, Makila, all lived together in a beautiful yet cozy two-story house that her father had built for them from the surrounding woods. For the most part, they all got along famously, but Myla and her brothers would sometimes fight themselves find themselves at odds, and not in a friendly way. Her eldest brother, Zarel, had a wise-cracking attitude and was bossy with Myla, and Amethal, her second oldest brother, was a no-nonsense gentleman with a very dry sense of humor and a lackadaisical disposition toward his sister and his brother. Despite all this, she loved them, and they loved her. Good morning, Makila smiled gently, wide awake again, I see. Were you up reading? Were you up late reading again? Mila shrugged. Sorry if I disturbed you. I just couldn't put it down. It was amazing. First, the character got dragged into going on some unexpected journey to a far off land by an old friend who just showed up on his doorstep one day. Mila feverishly did a run through of the book she had just finished as she peeled potato after potato. Her mother smiled and patiently listened to her as she recounted the story, barely stopping long enough to catch her breath in between sentences. Mila was always giving her rundowns of the books she read, and of course, every single book she read was amazing. At the end of the book, instead of just staying home and carrying on with his life as it used to be, he decided to go on another adventure on his own. Mila took a few deep breaths, trying to catch up with herself. Makila giggled at her daughter. Then Mila continued in a distant tone, filled with longing. Oh, Mom, I wish I could go on such an awesome adventure. Mila stopped peeling her potato and looked out the window, and Makila knew that she was far away again in a distant land she recognized as Mila's imagination. Makila sighed and put her own potato and knife down and looked at her daughter knowingly. That's plenty of potatoes for now, I think. Why don't you get the table ready while I finish up in here? Your father and brothers will be up soon and I would like to have the table set before then. Mila nodded and took her apron off before taking some plates of food and going into the dining room to set the table. Makila understood the longing that tugged at her daughter's heart was only natural for her. Yet, she did not know how to ease her daughter's angst in the slightest. She could only pray that the day would come quickly when her daughter would finally fulfill her destiny. Mila had finished setting the table and was now helping her mother put the food out when her eldest brother Zarel stumbled into the dining room half asleep and haphazardlessly dressed in a loose shirt and brown cotton pants. His light brown hair was disheveled and a shadow around his mouth and chin told Mila he hadn't even bothered to shave let alone brush his hair. Also, his shirt was half out and one of the pockets of his pants was hanging inside out. Behind Zarel came Amethal. In stark contrast to his older brother, Amethal was dressed in a white shirt, tucked into his black slacks, and a gray vest to top off his ensemble. His face was clean-shaven, and his golden brown hair combed back out of his face. Mila smiled at them as they entered. Good morning, 
she said brightly. They both paused and looked at her for a moment before taking their seats. They could tell right away she was suspiciously wide awake. What's so good about mornings? grumbled Zarel, frowning at her with one sleepy eye as he slouched in his chair over the table. Amethal sighed and furrowed his brows as he considered her. Were you up all night again reading? You do know that's not good for your complexion. Or your brain, Zarel piped in. Myla shrugged. I wasn't up all night. My candle burned out around some time around two, I think? To this, Zarel snorted. <laughs> and what time did you get up? Myla paused and counted back the hours. Six-ish? She said sheepishly, with a timid half-grin. It may have been closer to seven, but I can't be sure. Zarel planted his palm in his forehead with a smack, and Amethal sighed disapprovingly, crossing his arms over his chest. Just as they were both about to give her an earful, Makila came in with more food. Amethal got to his feet and helped his mother, still shaking his head at Myla, and muttering his disapproval. Makila thanked him and left for the kitchen again as Myla returned, arranging the silverware on the table. Amethal sat back down and considered his sister once more. Honestly, he began with a deep frown. I don't understand you. What do you mean? Myla asked, cocking her head to the side. I mean that you spend every day and night with your nose buried in those books. You hardly ever look another human being in the eye unless you absolutely have to. And you have no interest in men. It makes no sense. Myla shrugged at him, and he continued with a sigh. <sighs> what are you reading anyway? Adventure novels, she replied as if she had, he should already know. The two brothers looked at each other. It was Arel, though, who responded first. Why adventure novels? He puzzled openly. Because they're exciting, she grinned. Her brothers stared at her, still looking puzzled. Myla gave an annoyed sigh and elaborated. <sighs> no one will let me go on an adventure yet, so this is the next best thing. At that moment, her father came in with a giant grin on his face and a jovial, Good morning, all, as he sat down at the table. Not wanting to discuss it any further, Myla sat down and began, began filling her father's plate for him, a ritual she had done since childhood. Amethal and Zarel got the hint and left it alone. Makila came in shortly after with a few more plates of food, and Myla started filling her mother's plate as well. They all sat together at the table, eating quietly. After a few minutes of silence, Kino looked around the table and, sensing the slight tension between Myla and her brothers, began to speak. Theodore Tillman stopped by looking for you yesterday, Amethal. Oh? Did he say what he was needing from me? Amethal asked, looking perplexed. Something about his brother and him needing more help down at the mill. Apparently they're still having trouble with the operation of their new millstones. Kino said, taking a bite of bacon. I told him that I would let you know first thing this morning. Amethal sighed. <sighs> Very well, I'll see to it that I stop by later this evening shouldn't take me more than a minute to figure it out. More than likely, it's nothing more than an operator error. Kino laughed. <laughs> Probably. The Tillman boys aren't exactly the brightest apple in the bunch. On a different note, Sorel. Sorel cringed at his father's stern tone and looked up at him. Yes, sir. Kino got a stern look on his face. Did you have anything to do with the Williams girl last night? around duskfall? No, sir. You can ask my boss, Henry. I was working late last night and didn't get in till around two in the morning. Zarel answered quickly. You can also ask Myla. She was up at that time. Myla shot him a dirty look as her father's attention now rested on her. Kino's eyebrows raised slightly as he stared, her, stared at her intently. Oh, really? And just what were you doing up so late, young lady? 
Milo looks sheepishly up at her father. Reading? She smiled coyly. Kino sighed deeply. <sighs> More adventure novels, then, is it? Mila nodded. Kino looked her over for a moment. And that? And is what your brother said true? Yes, sir, Mila replied. Zoro came in the house around the same time my candle burned out, at around two. He was alone and covered in mud and grass. Mud and grass? Kino turned his attention to Zarel, who shot his sister a dirty look now. What did Henry have you doing? Digging in the mud with your hands? No, sir, Zarel replied. It was his pigs. They got loose and we had to wrangle them back into their pen. It took almost all day. And then the plow had a blade break and I had to get up under it to replace it. That's why it was covered in mud and grass. I see, Kino said, nodding his head. Then why did Tony say he saw you running through his field when he caught you fooling around in bed with his daughter? What? Dad, I never even so much as looked at that girl. She's as nuts as her family, Zarel screeched indignantly. That crazy woman has been trying to get in my pants since her family moved here, and she saw me working on Henry's farm. I believe him. Makila interrupted. Oh? Kino looked over at his wife with curiosity. Why? First and foremost, she began, Zarel has always followed your rules and has never been one to fool around with any girl. If he really had taken a liking to Patricia Williams, he would have courted her properly. Secondly, you and I raised him to be as gentlemanly as Amethal around women. I have never even heard of anyone saying anything before now about him being disrespectful toward another man's daughter or wife. Lastly, your son is the kind of man to speak truth, no matter the consequences. He is, after all, your son. Very true, Kino nodded. I'll stop by Tony's after breakfast and help him get to the bottom of this kerfuffle. As for you, young lady, I better not hear of you staying up like that again. Late nights are not for you. Yes, sir, Milo muttered. After eating and cleaning the dishes, she retrieved her knapsack and hurried to the library. It was midday, and the town was relatively busy. She lived just outside of a small trading town in the territory of Lorga. The town itself wasn't much. It consisted of one tavern that doubled as the town's inn, a fur trading store, a general goods store, a smithy, and a library. As she made her way to the library, in the center of the town, she stopped at the town's only inn and tavern to see her childhood friend Leo. He was a tall young man, around her age with a sturdy build, ear-length kinky hair the color of wet sandy beach, and eyes as blue as a tropical ocean. All the girls would flock around him and fawn over how handsome he was. Milo, on the other hand, hardly made any fuss about his good looks. She either hadn't noticed, or was too preoccupied with her lust for adventure. Either way, she would always tease him about the other girls and ask when he was going to hook up with one of them. He never really answered her, which she thought was strange. Hey Leo, how's business? She cheerfully chirped as she deposited her knapsack onto the counter and leaned in to look over it. Leo came up from crouching under the counter so fast that he slammed the back of his head into the lip of the bar that stuck out over him. Hey, ow! Hey, Mila. He quickly corrected his trajectory and stood at attention, rubbing the sore spot on the back of his head as he looked at her with surprise. Mila giggled, and Leo's expression went from shocked to a gentle, broad smile. Smile. Off to the library again? Hey! Wait. You didn't stay up all night reading that book, did you? No, not all night. I went to bed when the candle burned out, she shrugged. Leo sighed, putting his hands on the counter and leaning in to get a better look at her sleep-deprived eyes. 
His beautiful lips fell into a frown, and his perfect eyebrows knitted themselves together in concern as he stared deep into her eyes. What? she asked, tilting her head to the side. I'm fine. So what you looking for? Even though he didn't believe her, he shook his head, and turning his attention back to rummaging through the box under the counter, he continued the conversation. I was just searching for the hammer. One of the nails is coming loose on the floorboards out front. I was just about to go fix it. Where's your dad? Is he not working today? She said, glancing around. Nah. He's too busy with the ledgers to deal with running the bar or maintaining the inn. He shrugged and stood back up, holding a hammer. He set it on the counter and looked at Myla. I still have to cut firewood and tidy the rooms that are now open. Oh, and I have cups to clean and dishes to wash. I won't get it all done before check-in time. It was Myla's turn to frown now. Where is Gretchen? Shouldn't she be here doing the dishes and rooms while you tend to maintenance and physical stuff? Gretchen was the tight-laced, loud-mouthed woman who worked at the inn as the barkeep and waitress. She was in her 40s and had an obvious obsession with Leo's dad as she was always openly flirting with him whenever he was around. Not that he paid her any mind. Leo shook his head. She has a day off. I'm the only one here today. Well, Myla said, shrugging her shoulder, shoulder slowly. This book isn't due back till three days from now, and I have a good rapport with the librarian. So, I don't think it would be too big of a deal if I helped you out a bit. How's that sound? Myla smiled at him brightly, making his cheeks flush bright red. After a moment of staring at her dumbly, he shook his head. I, I couldn't ask you to do that, Myla. Besides, aren't you more interested in finding another book to read? By the way, what kind of books are you reading that you have that have you so enthralled? Are they like those heated romance novels that girls like? Myla rolled her eyes dramatically at him. <laughs> As if. No, the books I read are far more fascinating. They're all about famous adventurers and ordinary people who go, get to go on exciting adventures to exotic places. For some reason, Leo was not in the least bit surprised. Perhaps a little bit disappointed, though. He had always held out hope that there was at least a small amount of girliness under all that tomboy. I don't get you sometimes, he sighed, taking a cloth and wiping down one of the many glasses left on the counter. Myla tilted her head and furrowed her brows. What do you mean? Well, I mean, you run around in boys' clothing, you're always exploring and climbing things like a curious little monkey, and you never seem to have an interest in guys or dating. You're the most tomboyish tomboy I know. In fact, you're manlier than a lot of other guys I know. And they're manly men. What are you going to do? when you are asked to go out with someone. Hmm. Turn them down, I guess, Myla said in a mockingly thoughtful tone. Besides, women's clo Besides, women's clothing is restrictive, and I like my movement uninhibited. Come on, Myla, I'm serious, Leo said sternly with a hint of a whine. So am I. I don't have time for boys or dating, she snapped back. Why not? Well, because... Because I... She furrowed her brows at him, searching for a reason that wouldn't make him laugh. I just don't, Leo. Well, someday you are going to be the only girl who isn't married, and the man you're wanting to be with will be married. Do you want to end up like Gretchen? Old, never married, with no children, and a virgin? Oh, come on, Leo! Myla picked up her knapsack and slung it over her shoulders. I am not a child, nor do I need you to tell me these things. I have two older brothers who do a good enough job of heckling me already. And with that, she slugged him on the shoulder, turned on her heel, and walked towards the door. I'll check in later to see if you've changed your mind on the help thing. She waved to him over her shoulder and was out the door before he could even reply. 
He followed her out the door, rubbing the spot where, he had, where she had slugged him, and watched her walk down the street. Her waist-length strawberry blonde hair, her waist-length strawberry blonde braid glistened in the sunlight, and her bright gray eyes smiled gleefully as she turned to wave goodbye at him again. Leo's heart ached as he watched her go, and he had to force himself to turn around and go back inside. He felt like the world's biggest idiot. Once again, he couldn't tell her how he felt about her. Mila, meanwhile, was totally oblivious to his feelings. She arrived at the library and dropped off her book before hurriedly rushing back into the bookshelves to find another one. The more she looked, though, the more she realized that she had literally read them all. She sighed gruffly, then trudged back to the desk where the librarian, Dana, was sitting going over paperwork. Dana was a beautiful woman with her dark brown hair that she always had done up in a loose bun and honey-colored eyes that sparkled when she smiled. She had freckles dotting her face and always wore the, wore the most elegantly simple clothes. She looked up as Myla slouched against the counter, looking defeated. Myla, what's wrong? Dana asked, concerned that something serious had happened. Is someone teasing you again? No, Myla sighed. I can handle a bit of pointless name-calling. Having read all of your adventure novel books? Now that I can't stand. You what? Dana asked in shock, setting paperwork down. I've read them all! Myla wailed, banging her forehead into the counter and making Dana cringe. Myla groaned as a dull ache radiated out across her forehead. Ow. Are you sure? Dana cooed. Maybe you just skipped over one. No, I've looked through them all at least five times. I'm positive I've read every single one of them. Myla lifted her head to look pleadingly at Dana. Please, tell me there will be more coming in soon. I don't know, Myla. There might be one or two in the next batch that come in. But more than likely, there will mostly be romance novels, which... Most girls your age read like you read adventure novels. I don't give a flying rat's backside about that mushy crap. She rolled her eyes as she waved the thought away. It isn't exciting and the plot lines are always dumb and improbable scenarios. I mean, how many guys do you know that will talk sweet to their woman after they've snagged them? Hmm? The romance doesn't ever last. No, thank you. I think I'd... No, oh, thank you. I'd rather not get my expectations up just to have them crushed. Romance like that doesn't exist. Happily ever afters don't exist. Dana blushed. I can't speak for all the others, but I know of at least one man who's the exception. Dana was Amethal's girlfriend, and she was madly in love with him, and vice versa. Yeah, well, that'll end once you two are married, Myla pouted. Myla? Dana frowned at her. She knew she hadn't meant it to hurt her, but it still stung. Myla tended to speak her mind without thinking first. She had always been that way, according to Amethal. In fact, he had once told Dana, with a rather serious look on his face, that the filter between her mouth and her brain was thoroughly broken. What? It's the truth. Men don't respect us or our capabilities, Myla shrugged. Amethal is no exception. Trust me, I live with the guy. Dana sighed and put her quill down. She stood up and made her way around to the desk to hug Myla, as an older sister would do. Oh dear. What am I going to do with you, silly girl? I will keep my eye out for any more adventure books, and if I find one, you'll be the first to know. Myla nodded. She felt slightly guilty that she had lashed out at Dana over something so trivial. Still, she was tired of being told how everyone thought she should think and behave. Alright, 
Thanks, Dana. And sorry about my comment. I'm sure Amethal will treat you right. She left the library empty-handed and made her way home in a sullen mood. When she got inside the house, she could hear her brothers arguing heatedly over something. Curious as a kitten, she went to the living room to find out what the fuss was all about. No, no, and no! We're not taking her. She'll just get in the way, growled Zarel. Amethal crossed his arms defiantly over his chest. I just don't understand why not. For starters, she's a girl, Zarel snapped. And your point is? Amethal asked with one eyebrow raised. She can't take care of herself, Zarel replied angrily. Girls are notoriously weak, and she doesn't know how to stay out of trouble. I mean, look at what she reads. Myla's ears perked up at this. They couldn't be talking about her. Could they? Don't say such things about her. It makes you sound like a bigot. Besides, it might get her to settle down a bit, Zorel. Amethal took a pleading tone now as he pushed his side of the argument. She's 21 years of age and has not been courted once by any man. Not seriously. If she doesn't settle down soon and start acting like a lady, she'll wind up being a lonely old maid. Her love life is not my problem. Zarel scoffed. Don't try to guilt trip me. You know that she won't settle down until she's left Lorga completely. She's adventure crazed. They were talking about her. Myla listened in and tried to catch. Myla listened in to try and catch what they were talking about. If she wasn't going to be invited, she would just go alone. You don't know that. All it may take is one more chance to explore, and she might settle down, Amethal argued. Besides, she hasn't ever been to the Hidden Valley before. It's big, and the perfect place to safely explore. No, it's not. There are multiple things she could get hurt on. First, she has to get through Gotcha Tunnel, which, by the way, is narrow and people get stuck in it easily no matter how many times they've been through it. Then there's Hidden Valley Lake, in which those things live. Oh, and let's not forget about the abandoned temple. Who knows what kind of beasts are lurking in that place just waiting for some unexpected person to come along so they can tear them to shreds. Need I say more? I'll look after her if it'll make you feel better. Just let Myla come. The hairs on the back of Myla's neck stood on end, and her blood boiled up upon hearing her name. She had determined a few minutes ago that they must be talking about her, but hearing her name just cemented the indignation. They obviously hadn't noticed that she had returned, as they continued to argue. No! For the love of all that is good and right in this world, stop asking! It's not gonna happen! She's a girl, she's weak, and she'll slow us down, she's not coming, period, end of story. You incorrigible, self-righteous, male chauvinist pig! How dare you speak about me in such a manner, and behind my back! Myla, unable to stand the discussion any longer, screamed at Zarel with a ferocious bellow. Taken aback, both men turned wide-eyed to see their sister standing in the hallway, beat red with anger. Me weak? Who's the one that's always tapping out during practice? I'm stronger than most of the guys in town, including you. So who asked you, you jerk? And you, she turned her rage onto Amazon with a heavy glare. How dare you just assume I want to tag along like some complacent child in the first place. I will never settle down and be a good little housewife. I will never allow myself to have my dreams taken from me. I will go on an adventure. I will return when I am old and worn and die happily knowing that I, at least, found something greater than romance. And I don't need either of you jerks to do it. And with that, she turned about face on her heel and took off at a dead run. Behind her, she could hear her brothers hollowing after her to stop and to talk to them. 
but she had no intention of doing that. Instead, she continued at breakneck speed, as far away as she could, and she had no intention of going back for a long time. Alright guys, thanks for listening. I hope you listened all the way through. If so, then you're hearing this message, then please feel free to contact me with any suggestions or with any comments that you might have on the book or what have you. And I look forward to hearing from you. And I'll see you again in two months. Peace out.